Welcome back to Wordy and Nardy. It's been a bit since our last podcast. To make up for lost time, we are trying something new. For example, we are now doing these completely live every month on Twitch. Also, I'm editing these videos in a different way. Going forward, I'll make posts on Patreon and on YouTube when we're going live to record the podcast. Any feedback would be very helpful. Either way... On today's podcast, we're going to be talking about two movies, Guardians Galaxy Volume 3 and the new Spider-Man, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. The only two movies so far this summer that actually made profit. Sorry, Flash, maybe next time. Welcome back, and welcome to the first official live episode of the Wordy and Nerdy podcast. So, for those who don't know, we do have a podcast um, that we try to upload to at least once monthly, um, where we talk about nerdy things, pop culture, all that kind of stuff, and we decided that this month we're going to go ahead and make um, a, a live version, to both to you know, experiment with a different style and also, you know, get more people, more eyes and ears on the podcast and get more people to know about it um a version there's an audio version of the podcast that comes on spotify and itunes and then there's also a visual version that is edited down that he usually works on and uploads on our youtube channel today we are going to be talking about two movies that have come out in the last couple months that we have seen multiple times um one being uh guardians of the galaxy 3 volume 3 and the other being uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yeah, we are kind of doing a summer movie, summer movie catch-up for some movies we have seen. We have seen both of these movies a lot of times. Overall, I say we both enjoy Greatly. these movies. And honestly, it's like, there's like, this is a good summer for movies. Yeah, like there's a lot of other movies that are still coming out that we have. Like, we still need to catch up. I still need to watch um, Little Mermaid, and there's still there's at least one other one. I want to watch The Blackening. Yeah. Um, next month, I want to watch The Angry Black Girl and Her Monster. We want to watch Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, we uh, the Barbie movie. Barbie movie. Oppenheimer. All those. So yeah, bunch of bunch of movies coming out this summer. It's a good summer for movies. But I believe the first one we're going to talk about is going to be Guardians Galaxy Three. Highly recommend going to see the movie. But I don't. Yeah, wanna... this is going to be a very spoiler heavy yeah. uh, review for both movies. <laughs> So, all right, I have a few things. So, Guardians Galaxy 3 premiered on May 5th, and it is the second highest grossing film of this year. It has earned $821 million. I'm about to say, $100 million sounds yeah. very low. <laughs> yeah, $821 million. It's the last Marvel James Gunn picture ever before he moves over to DC and tries to figure out whatever he's planning on doing for that. He has a lot of work for him uh, based on the reviews of Flash and what I've seen online. <laughs> yeah, we didn't watch Flash. We no. just, uh, he read a couple of reviews online. I, I, yeah. <laughs> There's some um, video of Ezra Miller putting a baby into a microwave for Flash. I don't know why that's a thing in the movie. If anyone has context, please tell me. Either way, um, this is the final one. How do you feel about Guardians of the Galaxy 3? Do you feel like James Gunn hit the final mark for this movie? Because he wanted to do this movie for a good amount of time, especially tell the story with Rocket. He had this idea since Guardians of the Galaxy 1. Like, if you remember Guardians of the Galaxy 1, when Peter and Rocket were first in jail, um, Rocket takes off his shirt and he has all those mechanical parts mm -hmm. yeah, behind I do, him. I do stuff. remember that. And ever since he showed that scene, he has wanted to tell this story with Rocket. He said he would not feel right if he did not tell the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what, what was your question? Do you feel like he hit a mark with oh, this yeah. ending? 100% yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I had high hopes for the movie. A lot of people were like, oh, you know. I, I mean, I, I, I'll admit having a little bit of of worry just because the last couple Marvel movies haven't really been it for me like I wasn't super impressed with most of phase four um there were a few that I liked I liked Shang-Chi I liked um No Way Home um I didn't think Doctor Strange was too bad but like 
it, you know, just hasn't been, been as good since Endgame, you know, in general, with a few exceptions. Um, but because it was still James Gunn writing the characters, and he had written the, you know, was the one mm-hmm. who first introduced us to the characters, I felt like if anybody could do it, he could. If anybody could, like, make that work and bring that to fruition and bring a solid conclusion, that he could. And plus, I had seen other James Gunn stuff. I had seen, I mean, he, I, the man managed to make Suicide Squad a watchable, not just a watchable, but like an excellent movie. We went to see the Suicide Squad twice in theaters. Um, and it was so good. Like, it was so good. And it was crazy how he turned around those characters, how he made like Rick Flag a character that you could actually give a fuck about. Like, I was very impressed. And so, and we also watched Peacemaker, and yeah. we really enjoyed that. So I was like, James Gunn's a good writer, and I think that he can pull it off. Um, so I'm willing to at least give it a chance. And I was, you know, I was, uh, I won't even say I was surprised, because like I said, I, I expected it would be okay, but it, it definitely hit the mark for me. I think it was, uh, it was just a really solid, it was emotional, it had great action scenes, the um, effects and stuff looked really good, um, the choreography, the even the acting. I mean, the acting was like, not that I ever think the acting was bad, but like, for instance, Chris Pratt, I've never been super impressed with as an actor. I don't think he has a lot of range. Um, I think this is the best Chris Pratt performance I've seen in a long yeah. time, like acting wise. Uh, he was very good. So yeah, I definitely think it hit all the marks that I was looking forward to hit. How um, about you? Talking about Chris Pratt's acting, like since we're already in spoilers, um, when Rocket was dying and he was like actually like tearing up on like he had nothing there. He had like probably like a green ball to imitate Rocket there. Uh huh. And that was really impressive. His like tearing up and oh yeah, when he was trying to when yeah. he was trying to like bring Rocket back to life. Yeah, exactly. Very emotional. I mean, I'm sure they had some kind of stand in or whatever. Uh, but like. Yeah, when you th- when you do think about it, there were several moments where I would see him interact with certain things or characters and think in my head, like, that's either a person covered in, like, a mocap suit or, like, a tennis ball on a stick. And the fact that they're managing to get so much emotion out of it. I feel the same way with, like, a lot of the other CGI stuff, like, with the, the dragons in uh, uh, House of the Dragon, you know, how they managed to get so, like, all of those emotions and stuff on the dragons. And they the flying the dragon thing seems so real even though you know that it's just an actor on a rig going up and down like this um, you know i think that which is another reason that we know we need to continue to pay fucking artists because they're the, what makes this stuff watchable yeah, most definitely <laughs> like i don't get how people actually think that writers are not important at all yeah I mean, and they the think ai writers and forward. artists it's just like you know God, if you don't have good, competent writers and artists, you're gonna have a shit show on your hands. Like, it's just, there's no other way to put it. Yeah. But my favorite character has always been Star Lord uh, from beginning since he has ever appeared in Guardians of the Galaxy 1. In fact, I saw Guardians of the Galaxy 1 at least 10 times in theaters. A loser. Re- loser? Nerd. Nerd? Dork. Dork? And I think the reason why I cared about him, like, the most is because I feel like they have really well-rounded him as, like, this traumatic child who ran away and is clearly just running away because he's not willing to accept the emotions of his mother dying, his father being pretty much a psychopath person ego the living planet and he's a god he's more yeah. than <laughs> okay. yeah he's not like your average shitty dad yeah and he does not know how to process these feelings so he's been running around with these other groups of people who don't know how to process his feelings and finally for this movie james gunn brought it all home where all of them, all the traumatic people, they are finally get a happy ending at the end. Like mm-hmm. every single character. It's bittersweet, did. but <laughs> yeah, a yeah, bittersweet ending. But but um, but still, like, and one of the things I was mostly concerned about was that they were gonna kill off somebody, because I was like, well, you know, we've got this, um, we've got all these characters. I feel like somebody's gonna have to die, especially based on the uh, trailers and stuff like that. But um, I was. I was pleased to see how it ended in terms of like, you know, they wrapped up the story nicely and there was definitely a lot of pain uh, and stakes, but ultimately we did get to see our main characters and everybody lives, which is, yeah. I honestly did not expect, but I was pleasantly surprised by. It was a nice, 
you know, I feel like there's a lot of downer moments, especially in some of the recent Marvel movies. And so it was nice to just not have that for once. Oh, also that song you loved at the very end. Um, oh, yeah, the um, the uh, uh, the Florence and the Machine song. He wanted that as the finishing song. It's one of my favorite um, Florence and the Machine songs. I know that it's like her most popular one, but it, it really is so good. Um, it's a, such a good song. And uh, I was so excited when, when I heard it because I immediately recognized it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is like my song. I love this song. And yeah, it was the perfect song to end it on. It was the perfect song to... Um, to, to wrap it up on in terms of just like it fit the situation and it fit that sort of bittersweet energy and hearing and seeing the characters you know dance and sing I mean I both we saw it three times in theaters and I cried every single time <laughs> uh, well both of us are just suckers for people finding found family yeah found yeah. family movies they are amazing when they are told that's why I we like Suicide Squad, I feel mm -hmm. like, too. Oh, yeah, and, and then Found Family is definitely a recurring theme in a lot of James Gunn's work. Uh, Coda says, I've, I'm always impressed by all of the special effects in movies and the art in them. I remember seeing the water in Moana and the textures and just being mesmerized by them. Yeah, water effects especially are so good. I mean, it's truly, it cannot be overstated, like, how important the visual arts are to the visual medium. Like, oh my god, I saw the the most fucking rancid take on Twitter that day. Because I see a rancid take on Twitter every day that I log on <laughs> Twitter. But this one was like, it was like, this person was like, I think that there's like this phenomenon of like, uh, movies that are like visual eye candy but don't have the best writing. But the, op the, um, the examples that he gave was, um, let's see, everything everywhere all at once, into this, or across the Spider-Verse, um, Oh, God. Uh, fucking the P Puss in Boots, The Last Wish or whatever. And uh, one of the um, Wes Anderson movies, the, the French Connection or something like that. And, and everyone was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like the visuals, well, A, the visuals are beautiful on those shows, but it's not also not like those don't have writing and he was like well if if into the spider verse was a uh, live action it wouldn't be it wouldn't be as popular I'm like yeah because it would be a completely different medium dumbass it's like saying if you put a fish on a on the serengeti and made it run like a like a lion it wouldn't be able to do it like it's you're comparing two completely different things like art like a animation is a valid medium and b movies are a visual medium so why are you complaining that a movie would have beautiful visuals because, A, it's not like those movies have beautiful visuals in place of having a story. All of those movies have a very compelling story yeah. and beautiful visuals. Of course a movie's going to have beautiful visuals. Like, it's a visual medium. Why wouldn't it have beautiful visuals? So, like, the idea of people... I'm so sick of seeing people devalue animation and devalue, like, you know, writing as if that isn't a... It's like, what do you think makes a movie worth watching if not the writing and the visuals it's a film like what are you, what are you thinking what are you wanting from it <laughs> that guy sounds like someone who wants to be different oh yeah it, it very much had that vibe and it's like you know and people when the, the people were eating them up in the comments which i was pleased to see and some people were like you know i don't think that some of y'all realize that you can just say like I don't person. I didn't like this, or it wasn't to my taste. Without trying to come up with some like pseudo intellectual reasoning for it, you can be like, you know, oh, I, you know, this wasn't my favorite movie this year. Without being like, well, I just think that the animation is cheapening storytelling. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this movie was very visually pleasing. Yes, and everything. Like, I mean, one of the main characters was an animate was a, a raccoon. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a lot. Of, a lot of it isn't the writing, though, right? There's a lot of things that get cut for a movie. Time constraints. Writers are, aren't always in. Oh no, I'm not saying the. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying writers are very important to a movie. I'm not at all saying that um that the writers um are always at fault because yeah absolutely lots of studio interference happens that like cuts writers' abilities short and that's definitely part of the problem. But what I'm saying is like what I think writing and visuals are both really really important aspects of a movie. Because if you have bad writing and a bad story and bad visuals, then why am I? What am I watching this for? <laughs> no, I have the utmost respect for writers. We here at Wordy and Nerdy have the utmost respect for writers and yeah. fully support the writer strike and all that. So Dave Bautista and Zoe Saldana, uh, Drax and Gamora have came out saying this is their final movie with Marvel. How do you feel like these 
those two characters wrapped up? Are you satisfied with their endings, or do you want something more? Do you want them to continue? It doesn't sound like they are, but... Oh, okay, Kodo wasn't saying that. We were saying that. They were just saying in general, yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think the endings are, you know, I thought their endings were great. I mean, it's like, well, you know, there's always this, like, this thing, like, the actors will come forward and say, oh, I'm done with this character, whatever. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. Um, but I'm fine with that being true in terms of, like, you know, it can't go on forever. It's okay to put a bow on it. And I absolutely think that those characters wrapped up their stories in satisfying ways. Mm -hmm. And he has already came out and he said he does hope Marvel touch those characters again. But he wants the director, next director that takes over these characters, to put his own spin on it. He doesn't want them to imitate him. Or hers. Or her skills. Mm. And he overall said Peter Quill's willing to come back. I'm sure Bradley Cooper is willing to come back. All he has to do is just voice, really. Mm. Well, I'm surprised that, um, I'm surprised that, um, um, Chris Pratt, I thought Chris Pratt was done, too. Yeah. So I did not expect him to come back. And then Bradley Cooper also. There should be awards for voice acting because Bradley Cooper did an amazing job as Rocket. He has he did an amazing job ever since like Garden of Galaxy One. Yeah. He's fantastic. And I think isn't he your favorite character in Marvel? Yeah. Like my, 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 he's definitely one of my favorite MCU characters. Yeah. Like my favorite overall Marvel character period is probably Spider Man, but in terms of the MCU, Rocket is like my favorite. Where do you see these characters? going because the story pretty much ends with them all going their separate ways to figure out themselves mm -hmm. basically where would you take a volume four or do you think these movie think these characters should just show up for like the avengers movies or whatever's upcoming do you want or i don't just... necessarily need a need a guardians for i think three is a good solid number for most movie franchises to be I really feel like there's a few exceptions, but overall, the average movie franchise does not need more than three installments. I didn't think we needed a Toy Story 4. We certainly don't need a Toy Story 5. I just saw a headline that was like, they're bringing back Woody and Buzz for Toy Story 5. And I'm like, but why? For what reason? <laughs> and didn't they go in completely separate directions yeah, at the they, end of the they, movie? <laughs> they did. The whole point of 4 was Woody finding his own direction. Like, they just know... Three was the perfect ending. We didn't need four, and we certainly don't need five. This is nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm all support for this to be the final Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Um, overall, I think this is, like, I would say the best trilogy Marvel had. Oh, and yeah, Men's You, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, because um, I know a lot of people say Captain America trilogy, but to me, the first one's not as good as the second one. And I kind of like the third one, Civil War, a little bit more. You kind of like Civil War? What? Yeah, I like Civil War. No, you said you kind of like Civil War? As in you don't yeah, like that not, not as good. I said, when I said kind of, not as good as Winter Soldier. Oh. When, Winter Soldier, to me, is like one of the best standalone movies they made in a yeah. while. I mean, Civil War is great, but to me, I, I almost never think about that as a Captain America movie. I think of it as, like, an Avengers movie. Yeah. <laughs> like, I yeah, know it is a Captain America movie, but it's just, like, it involves most of the Avengers, and so I just don't think about it in the same way. <laughs> yeah, and um, at the very bottom of the list is Ant-Man trilogy. God, oh that... God. God. What about Thor Dark World? Thor Dark World, that's a bottom of the list. That's <laughs> very bottom. The only reason why the Thor movies stand up is because of Thor Rand Rock. Which that's, that's a very mixed opinion. Some people do not like Thor Ragnarok at all. I'm sorry. Some but... people really don't like the direction that Taika Waititi took with those characters. <laughs> I'm sorry. No one was clicking with Chris Hemsworth being super sad. And yeah, no. I was. I mean, I am not among those people because yeah. I personally feel that, uh, you know, who wants to watch Sad Boy, uh, the Sad Boy Chronicles of fucking... <laughs> Like I don't want to, I don't want to see that shit. I want to see an like an entertaining Loki and an entertaining Thor. I have opinions that like Phase Four wasn't as bad as people say it was. I'm not no. saying it was like the most amazing thing. In fact, I think it's one of the weak ones. But I think Phase Two is the worst one. Phase Two is boring. Yeah, but Phase Two is just pretty much the case of just let's do the same thing again. Like, for Iron Man 1, they, Iron Man 2, they just brought about another person from Tony's past that came out of nowhere, and then they fought. Same thing for Thor 2. Let him fight a villain, and um, him and 
Natalie Portman. Loki totally dies yeah, and stays totally dead, dies. and that nothing yeah. changes. <laughs> God. God, Phase 2 is horrible, and it's just boring. But I'll probably make a whole separate video about that later on. Mm. But any finishing thoughts for Guardians of the Galaxy 3 before we move into Spider-Verse? Oh, a final thoughts? Um, uh, yeah, just in general. I mean, it was a really, really solid film, a great found family film. That plus the Christmas um, special. Very nice, really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the characters, really strong moments. Um, uh, I, there was a lot of animal cruelty, which I wasn't necessarily expecting. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. That was hard to watch, but certainly made the villain very villainous. They, wow. <laughs> to me, he's like the worst villain ever, Marvel. Well, Coda says, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. But... Yeah, Thanos, step aside. The the animal abusing villain is here. <laughs> yeah. I, any, any villain that abuses animals, that's like top of my list of like hated we know from what if that Thanos likes dogs. Huh? We know from what if that oh, yeah. Thanos likes dogs. Remember he was petting dogs while explaining to Okoye that his plan for mass genocide was totally not mass genocide? <laughs> God. I, I did like what if. I did like the animation and stuff. Mm -hmm. I do hope they continue it and like add more animated series for Marvel and stuff. I know they're working on that x-men series coming back i know that are you excited for that i don't know if you ever watched like the old animated series of x-men i never did no i didn't i wasn't a huge into x-men which you know it's interesting because you think it would appeal to me but i just x-men is just one of those things i never was super duper into um i'm more of a spider-man gal but and with that as a segue let's, let's talk about spider-man oh yeah <laughs> So, we most recently saw Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, and overall, it's one of the best animated movies I've seen in a while. Ever. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Even ever, maybe. Um, but right now, when it's doing gangbusters, um, it's funny because Warner Brothers is actually complaining that the movie is doing better than the flash right now oh that's in good fact, that's wonderful to hear in <laughs> fact i have something let me pull this up real quick so right now spider-man across the spider wars has got 500 million dollars nice I and one of ours projected that the flash would make around 75 million dollars to 85 million dollars for this weekend Right now, it has only $55 million, and it has less movie than the opening of Black Adam. Yep. Where's the god? <laughs> and, yeah. And right now, they're complaining that Spider-Verse is taking up all the seats because everyone's just pretty much buying tickets for that. Of course the they flash. are, because it's a good movie, and it doesn't involve anybody who, as far as we know, has committed horrendous crimes. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> like, there, there's no there's no emotion. <laughs> karma for the cancellation. Exactly. Karma for the cancellation of the Batgirl movie, not to mention karma for every shitty thing that Ezra Miller has done, and it just deserves it. And also, I'd like to point out that the two top, the three top grossing movies in theaters right now are all black leads. We've got um, The Little Mermaid. This is not the order that they're in. We've got Transformers, The Little Mermaid, and uh, Spider-Verse are three of the best uh, grossing movies, at least as of last weekend before Flash came out. Yeah. And, um, but maybe still. And they all have black leads. So what happened to all that talk about how, like, oh, well, they just don't make movies with black people because they don't sell. Apparently they do. Because the top <laughs> grossing films are black people. Black Cinema Summer. Suck it. And uh, the white movie right now, Flash, is not doing that well. Oh my god! Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> just listen. I mean, if it was a halfway decent film or had a halfway decent, um, you know, main character, then it, I'm sure yeah. it would do really well. But it's just like nobody wants to support. Nobody wants to support Ezra Miller because why the fuck would you? I saw the animated Spider-Man movie from a few years ago, the one with Miles Morales. I haven't seen the sequel yet. I went to see The Little Mermaid, the last movie I saw on the big screen before that was in 2019. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, yeah, the second one's Miles Morales, too. Um, so this is the sequel to the Miles Morales one. And the first one was amazing. I didn't even know, I did, that's the thing, it's like, it's so incredible how good it was because it was gonna be hard to top the first one because the first one was so, so good. 
Um, and I seriously, these are two of my favorite animated movies, and I'm pretty confident the third one would be just as good, and this will go down as my, like, favorite animated trilogy of all time. Because they're just so good. They're such good movies. The animation is incredible. The, the way they raised the bar on this animation, like, this movie was delayed a little bit, because it was supposed to come out last year. Yeah. And I remember when they announced it was delayed, I was a little disappointed, but I remember thinking even then, like, if they felt like they needed to delay it to make it the quality that they want, I trust them because um, because uh, it just you know it was, the first one was so good that I feel like if they're gonna make one that lives up to the first one, if they're gonna have to spend extra time, that's fine. Um, and not only the fact that they they to know that they spent extra time and some of that extra time that they spent was literally spent like involving fans in the process of the movie, like that the Lego sequence was I have so many fun facts about this movie. The Lego sequence, Lego Spider Man sequence, was animated by a fourteen year old boy. And it happened after they the movie was in post production. Like they had, he had made a, I believe, if I understand the story correctly, he had made a Lego version of the first trailer they released for Into the Spider Verse, and it went viral. And the directors found it, and then they reached out to him, and they were like, "We want you to animate something for the movie." And his dad bought him a new computer, like that with a larger rig, so that he could he could process it on Blender. And that's just so crazy to me. Like, and also there was characters like um, Charlotte Weber, the Spider. Sun Spider, um, who is a very recent addition who came, who was a Spider Sona that was invented by fans after the first Spider Verse movie, which only came out in like 2018, um, with the first disabled Spider person. And she made a cameo in the film and was voiced by a black disabled, an Afro Latino disabled woman, which is so cool. So it's like the, the representation levels were off the charts. The fact that they had. They had disabled characters who were written by disabled people and being performed by disabled actors. They had like they told they said they had to re they rewrote the whole Spider-Man India um, scene because what they had originally written they didn't feel like legit representation yeah. and so they're like let's revisit this. They asked the voice actor for that Spider-Man um, plus to give his input on the character and they hired two Indian comedy writers to come in and like rework the script to make it sound more authentic, which I just thought was so cool. You forgot about Spider-Punk, how they spent like over oh, yeah. two or three years, three years. just animating it. Spider-Punk took three years to animate because every part of his body, every part of his body moved at a different frame rate to give him that kind of choppy quality, like where he's like 2D to 3D. And he also has like color, like the way they used color in this movie. Like Hobie turns pink when he's around people he likes or, or protects. And like he has like this like the different ways that he shows up depending on what like whether he's black or white or in color depending on what background he's in, and like with Gwen she lives in this like mood ring watercolor universe where like the colors that surround her and other characters reflect her emotions, um, or and the emotions of other characters, which is another just really cool thing. Like when she's having that first conversation with her dad, and there is a coldness between her and her father. It, that is demonstrated by like the scene, the backdrop of the scene literally being blue and like her being cast in blue. And then when they hug, it turns into like this warm pink. It's just crazy what they did with like the colors and the lighting and the, the character designs and how every spider person had like a slightly different kind of animation style and like their universe looked different. It's just, I go on for day. I mean, there's all these little details that like you can watch it 10 times and not notice all the little things that they put in there. Um, it's just, it's a masterpiece. It is a glorious, gorgeous film that was clearly made with a lot of heart. And um, it just, to me, it's just a testament to how amazing animated films can be. And it, it drives me crazy that people continue to act like animation is not like a viable art form when you have something like this, which is just pure art. They could have shat some illumination level project out and I'm sure it would have made money. Like, if they had just given us a very generic Spider-Man movie, but they, they put the effort in because they cared about the product that they were creating, and I just love that. Yeah, like, I, you are 100% correct, and I do not get people who saw this movie and thought it was rushed, or they did not like the cliffhanger, God, I, the people who were like, oh, and this movie didn't have a real ending, it didn't have a real arc, because it was a to be continued, like, I, what movie did you watch? How is it not an arc when, like, a character literally starts a movie in one place and, like, is narrating and then the movie ends with them narrating and literally building directly off of their opening narration? That is, like, textbook bookending a film. How is that not an arc? <laughs> like, it just blows my mind how people can just say that with a straight face. Like, have you ever seen a movie before? What are you talking about? <laughs> 
<laughs> I just don't. I get... also got into it with a friend of mine. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. Uh, um, I also fine. got into it with a friend of mine the other day where he had a completely different take on like the story where he was like, I think that um that uh that fucking O'Hara is right and that, you know, sacrifice is an important part of being a hero and that he needs to and that like Miles is or whatever and I'm like, bro, first of all, it's not really about sacrifice. It's about him deciding that because he had like a fucked up life that <laughs> that Miles has to sit around and watch his dad die and not even try to do anything about it. Meanwhile there are plenty of there's plenty of evidence that O'Hara's theory is stupid, like the existence of Mayday, which Peter only says only happened because he met Miles which was never supposed to happen like the movie is clearly saying like you know just because somebody says your life is supposed to go a certain way doesn't mean you have to follow the rules um and then that's the whole character of like spider punk and everything you know fighting the establishment so it's just like oh you had a very different takeaway than I did for that movie <laughs> I don't know how your friend got that takeaway <laughs> at all I'll be honest with that um so since we're talking about Michael O'Hara. How is Miguel he... O'Hara? Oh, Miguel. 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 <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> Michael O'Hara. This is not <laughs> That man is Latina <laughs> Latino. <laughs> he is half Irish, but yeah, no. Uh, Miguel O'Hara, what about him? <laughs> so how you know more in the comics than me. Yeah. Um, how is he a vampire? Or is that... Where did that come from? They didn't really explain that. Yeah, they might get much. into it in the second movie. I don't exactly remember all the details about that. But, I mean, he is a vampire. And he's kind of the more... He's, and they make reference to that. He's definitely a broodier Spider-Man. Because most of the Spider-People are very... Um, <laughs> are very, you know, happy-go-lucky. Or not even happy-go-lucky, but they're just, like, the, they make jokes. And, you know, Peter B. makes that comment about, like, how are you the only one of us who isn't funny? Like, we're all funny. Um, so he's a very different kind of Spider-Man. But I haven't read that many of his comics, so I'm not super familiar with him as a character. Um, I imagine maybe they'll get more into it in the thing. But, and he does make the Spider-Society in the comics. I do know that. Um, and that that becomes like his sworn mission and I think it's pretty similar in terms of like the universe there's like a multiversal event that tears his universe apart and he loses his family um but there's all kinds of there's all kinds of stuff that like needs to be explored there and even the whole like you can't like break the universe to make your to get your family back is a theme that was in the first movie too because remember how that was um what's his face uh the fat guy Peter B. Parker no the fat guy the kingpin kingpin yeah <laughs> 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 uh, yes, acoustic. You can, you feel free to explain Miguel if you know more. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, he's trying to get his family back through, and that's what starts the whole interdimensional shit that's happening. Remember? Yeah. I yeah. Um, which and then that's another thing where people are like, "Well, see, it didn't work for him." But like, first of all, when Miguel fucked up the universe, it was because he went to somebody else's universe. And also, and even with Kingpin, he tried to go to somebody else's universe and, like, kidnap his wife and kid from that universe. But that's not what what Miles is trying to do. He's trying to go back to his own universe and save his own dad. Yeah. He's not... <laughs> like, he's not trying to steal his uncle back from another universe or something like that. <laughs> so, what do you think about the revelation that uh, Miles is the first glitch or first oh the, the whole idea that he's yeah. an anomaly is, yeah. is really interesting yeah i think it's really interesting um because and again it fits in with 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 miles's characterization how he is like the idea like first of all there's so much like amazing meta commentary in terms of like what it means to be from a multicultural household and what it means to be a black kid in spaces where you're constantly told you don't belong or you're not you didn't work hard to get here or you're just a scholarship kid or whatever um and you know when his mom has that speech with him where, she, where she's like you know you're not don't let them tell you that you don't belong in places obviously she's not thinking spider society she's yeah. thinking like the schools you're gonna go to but the way that like there's a meta commentary there in terms of like black kids in spaces where they're constantly being told you have to do this you have to follow these rules and you you're not really supposed to be here you're a mistake you're this that and the other um you know it's uh it's like i think that, and i think that there it's not an accident that characters like you know hobie relate so much to miles and like supported him so much because it's just like you know this idea that you are constantly being told what you have to do and who you have to be 
and pushed me back and was like, I'm going to do my own thing. Like, Miles' whole arc is like, you know, everyone, my parents, my friends, everybody thinks they know better than me. They treat me like a kid and they act like, they just try to dictate stuff for my life and tell me what I'm supposed to do. And, I, you know, no, I don't, I'm, I don't want to do that. I want to do, I want to figure stuff out on my own. Even in the first movie when he's walking around with his shoes untied, like, you know, I'm sort of like, tie your shoes, you're going to trip. And he just... He's always been a character who's like, I'm no, I don't want to just be told I have to do something and it has to do it has to be this way. I want to forge my own path. That's such a key part of his character, and I think that's very relatable to a lot of young people and especially young people of color. Okay, so I read that partly wrong. He, it was the highest grossing film of twenty twenty worldwide, making up five hundred Oh, I think they were talking about a Japanese movie. Demon Slayer. Yeah, Mugen Train. Yeah. Um, yeah, Japanese animation is a whole different ballgame, but yeah, there's tons of uh once again, ton, tons of uh, audience for that that proves that animation is not dying, um, even though fucking uh, Warner Bros. likes to pretend that it is. They didn't give Cartoon Network any new shows, and they canceled all of the old ones. They yep. made them cancel Craig of the Creek. They made them cancel Infinity Train. I'm just like, what is going on here? Why do they keep... They made them cancel like a bunch of cartoons that were well-liked and popular, and just made them keep making like the same three. Like, nope, you're only allowed to make fucking Powerpuff Girls remakes. Like, what? <laughs> I don't know what Warner Bros. is doing. I really think they're putting all their eggs in one basket for this new DC universe. Which is reboot. stupid. It, it, what's stu- it, it makes me angry because it's like, not only are they screwing over a lot of hardworking animators and stuff like that, but like the way that they will insist on putting all of their eggs in the basket of something like Ezra Miller. Like, they had plenty of opportunities to cut ties with Ezra Miller. Yeah. Like, they tried to make the excuse now, like, oh, well, the reason we didn't cut ties with Ezra Miller is because we're, the movie was too far along, and think of all the people who worked on it, and it's just, it would cost millions of dollars to redo it, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, yeah, but it's not like the stuff with Ezra Miller just started happening. No. Like, Ezra Miller was doing fuck shit, like, for years. Stuff that a lot of us didn't even know about until it started coming out, but stuff that had been going on for, like, years and years. So there were plenty of opportunities to rein this in and you didn't do it. And now, I mean, the fact that they were even making reshoots with Ezra when they when they were uh, on the run from the cops. Yep. <laughs> like, just like, what the fuck? What like, is going on? There's no standard. And it's like, you will put all of your eggs in the worst baskets, but not give legitimately talented, creative people a chance to do what they want to do. But then be like, oh, and like the director insisted, like all of the defense that came out for Ezra too, where like one of them one of the people was like, oh, I can't imagine recasting The Flash with anybody else because nobody could play that role the way that Ezra could play that role. And I'm like, that doesn't even make any sense. Even if you take away all the shitty, awful things that Ezra has done, like, they're not a very great actor. I mean, no. even, like, even watching the trailer, I was like, wow, Ezra is the weakest part of this trailer. Like, Ezra's not a good actor. <laughs> like, yeah, another big complaint I've been hearing about the movie. Um, they, You know how there's, like, double Flash and stuff and yeah. all that stuff? Apparently, the voice clips does not match. It's like, they clearly did not film on the same day and same everything. It, it feels... Well, no, because half the time Ezra was running from the cops, yeah. so they had to, like, you know, they had to film around that schedule. <laughs> there feels like there's a pause in between every time when, like, Ezra talks to the other Ezra and yeah. everything. It just feels awkward, people says. It's just... I just, you know, and it's hard to get that kind of stuff right because, like, they did that, they did a little bit of that in Star Wars with the um, Rise of Skywalker when, like, Leia, when they used archive footage of Leia, which, I mean, they should have just killed Leia off in the second movie, um, when they used archive footage of Leia and made her talk to characters, it was very awkward and stilted because there is a rhythm to, like, the way that people talk to each other that is hard to replicate with, like, recordings to make it sound like an authentic conversation is happening. Um, and so whenever, like, there's one where, like, Rose Tico talks to, um, to Leia, and it just, it's so clear that these people were not in the same room and they were not talking to each other. <laughs> yeah. And I, I just, they also have no excuse. They're like, oh, plenty of people worked on this movie, plenty of people, all that stuff. But what about Batgirl? Batgirl had the same situation, and they were like, oh, let's just get rid of that. Yeah, I mean, well, they didn't spend quite as much money on Batgirl, but still. Like, they were like, oh, the test screening was, you know, wasn't received well. And then, then fix it. Spend money to fix the movie. I mean, there's just no reason to cut that movie that people were actually kind of excited about to, to like, give us Flash. I mean, uh, yeah, I was... of all the movies to cut. 
I was way more excited for Batgirl than whatever the world flashes. And I refuse to believe that that was an unsalvageable story. Like, it, you're, like who did you hire to write it? And how much time did you give them? How many resources did you get them? Because there's not, there's no authentic, there's no like just inherent reason that that movie should have been so unwatchable that you couldn't possibly save it. I just that just doesn't make any sense. And to me, that sounds like that sounds like a you problem. You've done something wrong if you've produced a movie that's that unwatchable. <laughs> And plus, you spent like five or six or ten million reshoots on this movie, and it still turned out to be yeah, and like... it's still subpar. So unlike the other Spider people, Miguel wasn't bit by a spider. He had half the DNA, his DNA written. Sorry, he had half his DNA rewritten with spider DNA. He also doesn't have spider sense either. It's where, and that's where his teeth come from. Um, he has the venom glands of a spider, like a spider does when they bite you. You'll be so when he bites you, you'll be paralyzed but i don't know if his claws secrete venom as well okay so that's his deal yeah he doesn't have spider sense and he actually has like the dna of a spider and he can like he'll poison you with his fangs well that makes more sense because like at the beginning of the fight between spider gwen and vulture when he comes through and she says oh you can handle yeah, that that makes sense yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, yo, that's a good point yeah that's a, i didn't even think about that but yeah because well, yeah i didn't even think about that but yeah why wouldn't miguel spider sense tell him that that that, him, that uh vulture was right behind him it wouldn't yeah. notice immediately i mean when did physically see him too but like you would think spider sense would have made him yeah. notice that <laughs> yeah <laughs> So um, th thank you for yes, thank that you for that for that because that makes yeah. that helps make a lot more sense. It's also not impossible that they just don't want to take time to put more effort into finding a new actor. They can, they just don't want to. So, oh, absolutely! No, I don't buy for one second that they couldn't find another actor than Ezra, or that they couldn't have reshot that movie or scrapped it because again, the movie was in production now for like fifteen years. At a certain point, you can just say, you know, maybe we just don't need to make this movie. I mean, they insisted on making Black Adam despite it being in production now for years and years. And that just ended up being an extremely mediocre movie that everybody watched, said, huh, and moved on with their lives. <laughs> and, 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 and The Rock went from, like, all of this grandstanding and the, the hierarchy of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, so blah, blah, boo, boo, to basically being, like, uh, not so much fired, but let's say politely asked to leave. <laughs> no, when fired. It, when it I'm came. sorry. <laughs> I never saw someone that retreated back to what he was good at so fast. He's like, okay, I'm back on Fast and Furious. We're doing a Moana live action movie now. Yeah. We're doing everything that everyone loves about me. I won't take any risk at all. Just throwing shit at the wall. Just throwing anything. Please, I bought a $5, million, $5 billion mansion. I have no idea how I'm going to pay for this. Oh my god. What, what, what do you think about Moana being live action? God, no, no. I don't want that at all. No one. I also don't want this godforsaken live action Lilo and Stitch. I want that even less. Like, what the fuck? No one asked for this shit. No, who asked for this? And they can't, they clearly can't get casting right. No. Like, what? The, the first few casting announcements were such a nightmare. They got that one, the one very light skinned girl talking about, oh, she's going to play Nani, who is canonically a dark skinned Hawaiian. Like, people were given all kinds of arguments like, oh, well, light skinned Hawaiians exist. I am not saying they don't. I'm not denying that for a minute, but Nani ain't one of them. Like she never was. Like please stop. And then, and then the first person that they had for David uh, was also kind of light skin, but also just like was saying the N word. Did you hear that controversial? No, I did okay, not. Okay, so the first, so literally, literally, it was it happened in the course of a week. They hired. They announced who they had hired. First of all, does Disney just not do background checks anymore? Because it like, feel like you it. fit with the Jonathan Majors thing, and then recently we've heard the thing with the actor who played Namor in um, Black Panther might be like a sex offender or something, yeah. um, allegedly. And then, and then there was um, and so anyway, so they announced that they had hired this person for David within like two a day or less. Somebody googled them, and they weren't even trying to like expose them. They literally were just googling them to see what they had been in or whatever. And the first thing that popped up on Google was this person's Spotify page where he talked about the music he listened to and he referred to rap as, and I quote, nigga noise. <laughs> Again, the person who found this, uh, the person who found this wasn't even looking for it. They were just like googling the person's name, and that's what came up. The first thing that came up in a Google search was "nigga noise." I'm like, did nobody at Disney do a one single Google search? <laughs> so anyway, after that happened, they fired that dude and hired somebody else. And again, this happened in the course of like a week. <laughs> How don't they do background 
checks. <laughs> I shouldn't be able I, to I really Google like, an actor I, and find that out. No, I genuinely think that Disney is like intentionally not doing background checks because they're just saving money by just like hiring people and then announcing it and then letting the Twitter investigators figure out if this person has ever done something fucked up like that. <laughs> I genuinely think that's how it's going down. Where they're just like, okay, we'll just announce this person, and then if they've ever done something cancelable, the internet will find it. <laughs> I, they're casting wrong on purpose at this point. I think they just hate other dark skin, particularly black and indigenous people, and they're refusing to cast accurately. Yeah, one hundred percent. I agree. I agree with that. And the thing is, the thing that annoys me is like that makes me very, very scared for this live action Princess and the Frog that they also have planned. Again, didn't ask for it don't want it. No. I really don't need a live action version of the movie where the black girl's a frog for 90% of the movie. Um, and I'm also just terrified that we're gonna get fucking Zendaya or some shit to be Tiana. Like, stop. I just know that they're gonna cast some light-skinned girl to be Tiana and I'm gonna have to throw myself out of a window. I don't <laughs> want this. <laughs> Courtney B. Vance isn't giving me and the thing is they weren't even gonna have bubbles at all. Initially they just weren't gonna have bubbles at all. And then everybody complained so much that they like quickly were like, okay, 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 we'll get Courtney B. Vance. Uh, <laughs> I think Courtney B. Vance can pull it off because he has played like a government official before. He used to play a lawyer on Law and Order Criminal Intent, which my mom and I watched a lot. Um, so he can pull off bubbles, but the fact that they just weren't gonna have bubbles at all until everybody was like, What the fuck? <laughs> It's like when they announced Mulan and they were like, no songs, no Mushu. Like, why? Just stop doing it. Don't make the movie. <laughs> Man, you know what happened to the movie? Nothing. It was a terrible disaster and it caused Disney a shit ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lighter skinned, white, and indigenous, but it's so damn obvious to me. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's like, and again, people, I'm not in at all discrediting like lighter skinned, indigenous people because Lord knows colonization be doing what it does. But like when you have a character who is already established as canonically dark skinned indigenous, then to turn around and be like, well, any old light skinned person will do. It's just like, no. Like again with Tiana, I know they're going to cast some light skinned girl and then people are going to be like, what? So you're saying light skinned people aren't black? No. I'm saying Tiana ain't light skinned. <laughs> <laughs> Bubbles was important to Lilo and Nani. He is literally the, in the cr credits at their birthdays in Hall. Exactly. Because, and, exa be and a, the, one of the important things about Bubbles is like, not only is it important that Lilo and Nani are dark skinned, but it's important that Bubbles is there because the idea that Bubbles is working for a government system, a government system which is like harassing an indigenous young woman and her sister and basically acting like, you, you're not fit to take care of this girl and you should let her be a ward of the state, which... Of course, it's not stated, but I mean, it can definitely be inferred that part of the reason they're so hard on Nani is because she is you know, like dark skinned indigenous and they don't believe that she is as capable of taking care of Lilo as a white family would be. And the fact that Cover Bubbles is a black guy and he's working within this system, but he's probably more compassionate to their situation than a white agent would be because like he gets it to some degree anyway, even though he's still working for the government. So like that's an important, that like POC solidarity element of the relationship of Cover Bubbles and um, Nani and Lilo and to just take that away it's just like hello like and one thing I'll notice this is just kind of only sort of related but um, I've noticed that there are lots of things in the writing of like Lilo and Stitch and even the Lilo and Stitch TV series that seem so informed on like what the situation of natives in Hawaii is because there are references there's like a deleted scene where Lilo interacts with like a white tourist and it's very much like he treats her weirdly and, and it is a it's a glimpse into how, uh, you know, N Hawaiian natives are treated in their own space by white tourists. But also in the show, in the Lilo and Stitch TV show that was on Disney Channel, um, I was watching it, re-watching it with some kids I was babysitting. And there were some references, like at one point, Lilo is getting into it with like a local cop. And he was like, he's like telling her to stop getting into trouble or whatever. And he's like, you know, Miss So-and-So, uh, mentioning like an older lady who lived in the neighborhood. She's on that, she, he mentioned something about her being on like welfare or something like that. Um, and you know how Lilo shouldn't stress her out, but, and it's just, it's just a passing reference, but the fact that we've got a native Hawaiian cop talking to Lilo, a native Hawaiian, about another native Hawaiian who lives in her neighborhood who is living off government welfare. And like, again, that's just reflective of like the life and the reality of a lot of native, Hawa native Hawaiians. And I just, that's important to the story. <laughs> yeah. So were they not going to have bubbles in the movie or was there 
casting a white person as bubbles. And then they just weren't going to have bubbles. They were going to have like a woman government worker. They just weren't going to have bubbles oh. at all. Um, and then a lot of people complained about that. So they yeah. they just like very quickly cast Courtney B. Vance, who's uh, Angela Bassett's husband, oh, as God. um as bu- bubbles. <laughs> What, what were they thinking not even having bubbles in yeah, they, the do, they make all kinds of stupid decisions like that when they do these live action remakes. This is why they should stop doing them. They almost never make the right choice. I will watch The Little Mermaid. Um, I've heard The Little Mermaid is one of the best ones yet and they just really, really captured the magic of it. But a lot of these movies, they just make stupid ass decisions for no goddamn reason. Just to be like, oh, let's, what if we change this? What if we take this character out? What if we just, like, why? What if we don't? What if we didn't? What if we just left it alone? <laughs> I love that series. I woke up every Saturday morning to watch it as a kid. It was also the first movie I ever saw. Yeah, I loved that series too growing up. It was so cute. They had the, they had a cute little theme song. You're like, welcome cousin, you come on by, aloha, you come on by. And they remember they had that crossover with Kim Possible. And I think they won with American Dragon Jake Long. Man, I miss those Disney Channel crossovers. Those things were the shit. I loved them. It was like, it was like watching Infinity War or something as a kid when you turn it on and like, Kim Possible's on the Lilo and Stitch show. It was crazy. <laughs> So, do you think, when do you think Disney will run out of ruining, they're going to run out of animated movies to do, like the animal male told. They're going to start making stupid ass sequels, like the one they did with The Lion King. Remember they do like a Mufasa prequel? Because somebody asked for that, I guess. (laughs) Don't remind me of that. What the world is that? Why? Why are they doing a prequel on Mufasa? Who asked for that? (laughs) Like, you know, it boggles the mind. Like, fresh new stories, perhaps. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that we have a movie like Splatterverse, and it's making so much money, and no one actually learned a lesson. Like, n- none of the Disney executives or no one are learning their lessons. People lesson are clearly, like, in British stories, then you get these absolute brain rot takes that have come out, especially during the writer's strike, yeah. where they're like, oh, well, well, I don't even see why writers are important. You could just use AI to write shows now. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, a couple of things. First of all, AI is at no point, it's definitely not at the level where it can write a coherent script. It may get there, but it's definitely not there yet. Um, but secondly, even if it could, AI doesn't do anything on its own. It doesn't come up with new ideas. It just regurgitates what's already been done. And the irony is the same people who will say some shit like that are the same people who are constantly complaining. Like, people will literally say in the same breath, they'll be like, movies are all just sequels and remakes these days anyway. AI can do it. We don't even need writers. And it's like, are you? if you have a problem with movies being mostly sequels and remakes, you know what won't fix that? Fucking AI. <laughs> like, like, it's not like you're going to get more original ideas with AI writers. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I think live actions have the potential to be great, but they often refuse to do it right. Yeah, well, exactly. It's like, I've heard, like I said, I've heard really good things about uh, Little Mermaid. And Cinderella, I've heard, was really good. You know, uh, Beauty and the Beast wasn't uh, good, per se, but yeah, it was okay. I mean, it's just like, some of the, some movies, some stories can be translated into live action fine. But there's lots that can't. There's lots of stuff where the animation... It's just, like, Spider-Verse could never be live action. No. I mean, you could try, but it would be a mess. It wouldn't be as cool. It wouldn't be as interesting. Like, you just wouldn't have the freedom to do as much. And the thing is, when you have things like singing and dancing animals, you don't need to make the animals, like, hyper-realistic. Like, it's harder for me to suspend my disbelief about the animals in the Serengeti forming a chorus line for I Just Can't Wait to Be King when they look like real giraffes and hippos. It's okay for them to be animated giraffes and hippos. I think the reason why Little Mermaid and Cinderella are the best ones are because they are the most realistic. There's not that much CGI you have to technically do for the movie, so it's more of the acting than... Yeah, well, I mean, it's like with the mermaid, I mean, the, there is still, like, the, the talking fish element. I don't like the way that Flounder is designed for the little mermaid. But, I mean, the idea of a human, I mean, a mermaid is half human. So you can do yeah. a human with a fish tail and make it pretty realistic looking. Like, well, that's not too hard to convey. But when someone's, like, an entire, like, when we watched the fucking Pinocchio movie, where they were like, so the fish is going to be just like the animated fish, but in the real world. The real, li- the live action Pinocchio movie, where 90% of it was CGI. And I swear they formed, they filmed 90% of that movie in one room. Like, yeah. that movie felt so empty. There were hardly any extras. I will never forget how, like, when you had scenes like Pinocchio walking through the town, there was almost nobody in the town milling about to make it seem like it was a full, in, uh, you know, uh, populated world. Yeah. And then when, the, and the, one of the worst scenes in that movie was when he was riding in the with the lost children in the carriage or whatever, <laughs> and all of the kids, except for the one in the front seat, were 
obviously green screened in from a completely different location and their eye line wasn't even correct like they weren't even looking in the correct direction no. to where you could believe that they were actually physically there <laughs> they weren't even looking at pinocchio that no, was they weren't speaking looking at pinocchio. they were like they, they were, were like singing a song they were like looking in the middle distance like out outward like their eye line did not at all line up to where i could even believe for a second that they were physically there it was so obviously green screen for from the moment that i showed them, that they showed them on screen where it was like the one kid who was talking to pinocchio in the front of the car and then the other kids in the back of the car and it was immediately obvious that the kids in the back of the car were green screened in from another location it was so bad that shit was ass <laughs> uh, for me still for like the worst live action disney movie it's Moana. i mean not Moana. Mulan. Milan is like the worst live action remake. They didn't see Milan, so I can't speak to it, but I have a hard time believing it was worse than Pinocchio. No, it's worse. <laughs> it's <laughs> absolute worse. They like took all the heart out of it, like the comedian thing with Eddie Murphy and everything, and they added nothing back to it. Well, they also took all the music out, and they yeah. didn't, but they, they did the music, but they didn't replace the music. Like, there's a great, there's a great um, uh, video essay by Sideways on YouTube where he talks about how, like, the, the taking the music out of Mulan and not replacing it with dialogue made the movie bad because it was like if yeah. you're going to if you're it's like you can take there are situations where we take a movie that was not originally a musical and turn it into a musical like the producers where you have to take some of the spoken stuff or some of the spoken ideas and turn them into songs and then you can do the reverse where you take something that's musical and then make it not musical like with Les Mis when they made like a live action when they made just like a regular movie that wasn't a musical but you have to take the songs and turn whatever the songs are conveying into like spoken dialogue but they didn't do that for Mulan so it's like if you take the songs fine but you have to replace them with something you have to give us a reason to care the things that the music conveyed like the things the inner turmoil of Mulan the things that she's thinking the things her friends are thinking the things you know that like all of their feelings have to be communicated in some way if they're not going to be communicated with song then they have to be communicated in some other way you can't take the songs out and then not replace it with something the other reason why milan is like one of my worst disney yes they tried to take the, yes oh don't, don't get me started they tried to take the howard ashman documentary off of disney plus during pride month the internet bullied them into leaving it up though so there's okay i'm glad to hear that because i saw that headline and it pissed me right the fuck off first of all why there's no goddamn reason to take that documentary off there's no reason to ever take it off there's no reason it was a disney plus original it didn't like what you don't have enough space on your fucking servers there is zero reason to take that off so they so this what so you know howard ashman howard ashman was the guy who one him and and um and, and, alan menken um, basically single-handedly saved Disney Channel from like going bankrupt. They were the ones who wrote the music and the songs for uh, The Little Mermaid, for Beauty and the Beast, okay. and for a bunch of them. Howard Ashman was a gay Jewish guy who wrote all of the lyrics for Little Mermaid, he wrote all the lyrics for um, Beauty and the Beast, and a couple of the other movies, and him and Alan Menken, uh, their style is what brought Disney away from bankruptcy in 1989 with The Little Mermaid. And, so, and he like was such and he was so incredibly impactful to the Disney world that when he was dying of complications from AIDS in the 90s he had been working on I think it was Beauty and the Beast and um Michael Eisner I believe who was in no or maybe it was Jeffrey Katzenberger I think it was Jeffrey Katzenberg who was in charge of Disney at the time literally moved production from LA Anaheim or from Anaheim where the Disney studios are yeah. to New York City where Howard lived because it was getting too hard for him to travel back and forth because he was getting sicker and sicker and um, Jeffrey was like, I don't give a fuck. I don't want to lose you on this project. We will move the production to New York, to New York City so you can finish it. So he was, that was the first, the last movie he worked on before he died. Actually, I think, I think Aladdin was one of the last ones he worked on before he died. And so some of the songs in Aladdin are songs of his. Yeah. But anyway, this gay Jewish man who was such, who died way too young of complications from a, an illness which the American government let run rampant because they hated gay people. And um, it should still be alive today if the American government gave a fuck. Uh, but anyway, they had the audacity to try to remove his documentary from Disney Plus during Pride Month. Remove the documentary of the gay guy who saved your goddamn company during Pride Month? What the fuck? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and like... It's not even a cost-saving measure, either. It's just, like, the case of, like, they... I don't know what they're doing. Like, how much money do you actually save yeah, from, like, removing like, something? I, I don't... I, I don't... I don't get it. I really don't get how much money you're 
getting back from removing something. Right, yeah, I think he died, right, I think it was Beauty and the Beast that they moved production for, but he had also written a little bit of Aladdin, because he was working on them concurrently. But he, I think Aladdin came out after he had passed away. But Beauty and the Beast came out, like, right after he had passed away. It was the last movie he fully worked on. And like I said, they liked his work so much that they moved the goddamn production to a different, to the other side of the country, just so he could work on it, because his work was that good. He wrote the lyrics to Part of Your World about his experience as a gay man. Like, <laughs> yeah, I could go on about Howard Ashby for a long time. Um, but and Alan Menken is also Jewish, so keep make, take that down. Know that Disney is probably rolling in his grave, knowing that his company was saved by two Jews because he didn't like Jews that much. Uh, but fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my feelings. So speaking of, this is all, this is all related. But I saw this dumbass video of this black lady on TikTok oh the other day who was like responding to. I guess they had like some uh, femme, pre some like masculine presenting fairy godmother or something like that at Disney World. Um, so I don't know if it was like a trans person or uh, maybe just a man who likes wearing a dress or I have no idea what this person was. I just know they were masculine presenting in a in a. Uh, fairy godmother costume and somebody's like it was my fairy godmother or whatever and then she made the video and like I know Disney is rolling in his grave and I'm like bitch he would be rolling in his grave to know that negroes were allowed to come to his park please shut the fuck up <laughs> Whoa, who are you tap dancing for right now what the fuck are you talking about he would be he would be like what the fuck princess and the frog why the goddamn hell is there a black in here <laughs> the fucking song in the south which is all about how fun and dandy slavery was yeah i'm sure his feelings on this matter are very valid and important <laughs> like how are there all, every single company right now feel like they're doing like the worst decisions ever it's, it boggles the mind they're just actively and it's like and then the thing is they'll turn around like the disney plus has the odd audacity they're right now if you go on disney plus they'd be like celebrate pride they have a celebrate pride section yeah. where they push like shows with like lgbtq themes or whatever but meanwhile yeah. they turn around and like try to sneakily remove shit that has gay characters or remove a documentary about the fucking gay man who saved your goddamn company like what are you doing <laughs> i know god i'm still pissed off about owl house and how they treated that yeah show. they were just like mm, gay shit get that out of here wrap that shit up real quick <laughs> yeah I, I, get that gay shit out of here and then meanwhile you got shows like moon girl which everybody should watch Moon Girl on Disney Plus. That show is so great. It's got such great black representation. It's got queer representation. They literally went so far as like, there's a character, there's a student in her school that is a non-binary Vietnamese person, and they got a non-binary Vietnamese actor to voice that character, even though that character only has like a couple of lines in the whole show. It's just like that is some dedication to to representation that I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, but I just don't get why they are still attacking. Like, what's the point? Like, like clearly, that's what's making money. Just, I, I don't, I don't even get it. It's like counter business of what they're doing. Like, <laughs> if removing stuff that people actually want to watch is hurting your own business. So, what's the point of removing because it? Because there are some very wealthy, powerful people who are uh, who push a lot of these decisions and lobbying and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, on the opposite end of the scale, you've got Disney f pushing back against, like, DeSantis trying to, like, shut down the don't say gay bill or whatever. Yeah. And then, that, now, I've said, I don't support Disney and everything, but the way that they outsmarted Ron DeSantis with, like, their lawyers was fucking hilarious. <laughs> they, were like, they were like, oh, <laughs> they managed to get some law passed where they were like, um, so basically, because basically Disney has this like agreement with the state of Florida where they're basically like their own government. They can pretty much do whatever they want in Florida because they bring so much tourist re tourism yeah. revenue to the state. They can, they pretty much can make their own laws and do their own thing. And the same just tried to like cut, chop, uh, like clamp down on that. But, but, but and it wasn't even super secretly because it was a matter of public record. They just weren't paying attention. But when those people weren't paying attention, Disney got a law passed where basically they would maintain control over their land until the last descendant of King Charles III dies. Which, like, currently the last living descendant is, like, I think, the, um, I think, like, Meghan and Harry's second baby was just born. And so... <laughs> Yeah, so it'll be like another away. 80 years and plus that kid will probably get married and have yeah. kids so like basically never <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's all because and it, 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 it's crazy and the funniest thing about it is like King Charles is obviously like not American he's British but like you there's a there's a law there's a loophole in American law where you can like you can 
attach a contract to the life of any living person. They don't have to be an American. They don't have to be from that country. Like, you can just attach the the lifespan of a contract to any living person. And so they just chose King Charles the <laughs> Third. <laughs> There's a lot of target pride discourse. I'm afraid for the employees and other customers, but I couldn't care less. Like, what happens to some of those clothes? They've had... They're kind of ugly, and there's no plus plus. Yeah, I mean, the Target the target collection was pretty weak, but also the fact that they, like, folded because some conservatives got upset about it, and then they got, they got uh, like, backlash to the backlash because they, like, folded, and then a lot of queer people were like, well, fuck Target, we're gonna boycott. So then we had queer people, you had, you had the idiots boycotting Target because no more gay clothes, and then you had queer people boycotting Target because they folded to the homophobes. It's just a mess. Like... <laughs> God, we're, we've kind of off track here, but the point is, the point is gay rights. <laughs> <laughs> the point is gay rights, support the writer's strike, uh, down with capitalism, and all that fun stuff. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. Uh, is it, fellas, is it gay to work? Remember that video on TikTok of that woman who was like freaking out like, why are we making little boys wear all of this gay stuff? And she was pointing to like a dinosaur and bug t-shirt just because it had like some rainbow colors on it. Like, oh girl, what? God. There was another there was another woman. Remember the woman who had her kids paint? She had her kids pick out colors to paint the wall. And then her, her daughter picked out pink and purple, which are normal colors for a little girl to like. And then her mom was like, actually, no, we can't paint it that because those are the colors of the bisexual flag. <laughs> this girl was three. She just wanted her to paint her room pink. Like, 90% of little girls. And her mom was like, mm, but that could be gay, so no. I'm like, is it gay for a little girl to like pink and purple? What is going on here? <laughs> like, y'all are just hurting yourselves in your confusion at this point. <laughs> that sounds like that three-year-old is going to need some therapy afterwards. I mean, like, just like, what the fuck? The kids aren't even thinking about this shit. And then you want to accuse queer people of, like, trying to, like, get to your kids or whatever. But it's like, what? Y'all are the ones putting these bizarre ideas in your head. Your three-year-old says, Mommy, I like pink. And you're like, but sometimes lesbians like pink. And that's a not allowed, young lady. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, what? Who's forcing sexuality onto kids again? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> that sounds pretty gay. We only wear gray in this house. How dare you? Go read your Bible. <laughs> Oh God! Anyway, <laughs> so, um, so with all that being said, uh, I think I think we'll wrap it up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait. So, what? What's your overall finale thoughts about Spider Verse? So yeah, oh yeah, that's what we were talking about. Yeah, that's why Spider Verse is talking. amazing. Go watch it. Go watch it a thousand times. Give them all the money. Uh, Spider Verse is great. I'm very excited for the new movie, which they moved up. I think. Yeah. The image is like coming out in March. Very excited for that. Super pumped. Uh <laughs> and since we're talking about the sequel beyond the Spider Verse, yeah. it's planning on coming out. Let me double check when. Do, 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 do. All your notes, and you ain't got a clue. I don't have a clue. March 29th, 2024. So pumped. That gives me a reason to live until at least March 29th, 2024. <laughs> and also, you know, the twist at the end with um, Miles basically being Prowler himself, the yeah. other dimension. That's two different voice actors. Yeah, I knew that. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they got an Afro-Latino voice actor to play him. Um, which makes, I mean, because Miles is already, already left Afro-Latino, but he has more of a yeah. clear Af, uh, uh, Latino accent, or Spanish accent, and, and yeah, I, yeah, I knew that. Okay, <laughs> I did not know that. But, either way, I'm super excited for Spider-Man Beyond the, beyond the Spider-Verse. It looks fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Into, across, and beyond. Yes, yeah. very excited, very excited. Um, yeah, wonderful stuff. So, anyway, yeah, these are two very good movies. Thank you so much for joining us on our first, um, live podcast we hope you enjoyed it i i really enjoyed it i think we'll probably do this again um this is a lot of fun to a it makes us actually like sit down and do the podcast because sometimes we're putting that off um and um and it's fun to be able to interact with commenters and stuff like that um yeah this was nice thank you yes thank you so much for being um here for us and we'll definitely do this again um and we will uh so like i said soon this will be edited down and released to all podcast platforms 
and um, as well as our YouTube channel. So make yeah. sure that you're following us on YouTube. Make sure that you're following the Wordy Nerdy Show on uh, what your preferred podcast podcast podcatcher. Um, and we also have a Patreon that we recently started. So if you'd like to support us on Patreon, you have that option now. Um, we have a one, five, and ten dollar tier right now. Um, and if you subscribe on any tier, uh, you get your name in the credits of our po- of our videos and our podcast video and our podcast videos. So make sure that you check that out. Um, I think that's is there anything else I'm forgetting? No, I don't believe so. Alrighty. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you all next time.